Okay, so I know the content of this movie, but no robbing, okay? Why? No pulling out weapons, no nothing, okay? Last time I got yelled at, and I don't want to get yelled at Why again. Why did you get yelled at? Because you brought a freaking gun to the set. It wasn't a real gun. Uh, yeah, but viewers don't know that. We have you a disclaimer. traumatized. We, we have a disclaimer. About someone, views. Someone spent hours in After Effects making a disclaimer, and since we play the disclaimer, we are not responsible for anything that happens on the air. No, Oakland University is not responsible. We, we are. are. I feel like that disclaimer extends uh, alienation of responsibility to everyone involved, myself and you all included. No f***ing weapons! So, so I got this brand new knife just for today, just for today, and I can't use it? I can't use it? Give me the knife. You lost your privilege. Put it right no, no, get, put it in my knife. hand. Put it away. Put it in my hand. Sharp boy, don't let that size fool you. He'll cut you. Is that what you say all the time? You know what? <laughs> Yo, what up, it's your boy Matt McCormick here on what appears to be the set of The Take, the real take. I'm here with the baby communist himself, Horacio Zinglumbia, and this guy we have filling at the end of the couch, Aiden Schreiber. I know Sheber. Sh Shyham, Sheber. Shyber. Schneiber. Shyber. Schleiber. Shyber. Schneiber. Shy. Schwarbenegger. Shyber. Schneiber. What's the movie you were reviewing? The Killing. <laughs> <laughs> Back to the camera, the host, the host. Today we're reviewing The Killing, the 1956 Stanley Kubrick film starring a bunch of weird people that you probably have never heard of. Theme song! <laughs> Get it, Johnny. About these two other guys. You mean there's gonna be two other guys in on the deal? And we ain't gonna know who they are? That's right. You don't know who they are, and they don't know who you are. That makes sense to you, doesn't it? <laughs> well, yes, I guess so, but I... It makes sense to me, all right. How come we need them, though, Johnny? What are they gonna do? Oh, one of them's for the job with a rifle. None of you boys can handle that, even if you were willing to. And the other one starts the fight in the bar. These other fellas, how much are they cutting in for? Not that I mind. Anything you do is okay, but... These where's... men are not going to be in on the basic scheme. They're getting paid to perform certain definite duties at a certain definite time. And they're not cutting in on the take. They'll be paid a flat price to do a straight job. Well, if they don't know anything about the basic plan, about the job, then why are they doing it? That's simple. These boys are straight hoods. They get paid in advance. Five grand for the one with the rifle and 2,500 for the other. Well, where's this money coming from? Uh, that's where Marvin comes in. He's getting the 7,500 for us, and he gets it back off the top. I wish I could do more, Johnny. It's almost not right for me to get as much as everybody else. After all, all I do is... Your money counts for plenty, Marv. You don't hear any of them complaining, do you? Sure, you're okay in our book, Marv. But look, Johnny, if these two hoods get paid in advance, how do you know they're gonna do their jobs? I'll vouch for them. These guys are pros. They can't afford to weasel out on a deal. If they did, they'd be washed up, okay? Okay. Any other questions? Welcome back to The Take. Before we get into the review of the show, uh, we are going through some like changes going forward. One, you know. Puberty? Kind of. Definitely a maturity of sorts. Uh, what Hollywood is putting out for the past couple years and continues to put out has been utter garbage. Or it's just a streaming background bullshit. So going forward, I feel like maybe we need to look into the past and so today we're reviewing a film from 1956. That's the earliest that we've even touched on the take. Did Night of the Living Dead. Yeah, 1968, I think. Yeah, yeah. close to the 70s. We're going to throw it back. We're going to keep going back. In order to find where we should go in the future, mm. we need to reflect back on the past. We have so, to find our roots. Yes. yes. To go forward, we have to go back. Yes. To go east, we have to go west. To go north, we have to go south. You're picking up what I'm putting down. Here on out, for the rest of the season, and maybe for the foreseeable future, we are not going to review anything that came out after 1999. Unless we really want to and we break yeah, protocol. Maybe. We'll see what happens. Now, on the quick take, that, that, those rules still apply. You know, sure. It's whatever. It's quick. It's the new sh**. It's whatever. Blah, yeah. blah, blah. Yeah. But here, 
on these couches with this this sacred set this fern this everything nothing before 99 got it the killing came out in 1956 written and directed by stanley kubrick there are also two other screenwriters on that credit jim thompson and lionel white i have no clue what they did okay it's gonna be part of the fun going forward is we're not gonna know a lot of things and be damned if i do research here's a plot synopsis from imdb crooks plan and execute a daring horse race robbery that's it? That's pretty much that's all you got. All right. that's, that's very straight and forward to the point. Much like this movie, very straight and forward to the point. So let's just jump right into it. Horacio, what'd you think of the movie in 15 seconds? Go! Uh, I thought the movie was very quaint. Uh, it's one of those kinds of movies from the 50s, 60s, black and white. Um, makes you feel like you're in a different time. Um, it makes you miss, even though you've never lived it, the quaintness and the nice. Cut! Aiden. What'd you think of the killing? 15 seconds or less, go. For me, you know, I really, I didn't quite like it, but it was kind of fine for me. I know it's one of those movies that really made all the tropes for the different genre that it's in. But just because like all the other movies within the genre have reestablished what it's done, I just thought it was okay. Time, wow, you got real close there, buddy. Really, real close. I, him, I expected that, but you. It's my shtick. Okay. Otherwise I become, Unnecessary. Aiden brought up. Break down on the set. Uh, please don't break down on the f set. I can't handle Flash that to the right other now. breakdowns on the set of me screaming. <laughs> Why are you doing this? You have blood on my pants <laughs> and my shirt. One time. One time to ask you not to make a mess. Aiden brought up a very valid point that I want to talk about, which is uh, characters playing to type. And in this movie, that is. All it is, everyone is playing exactly to their type. Yeah, they're very two-dimensional characters. Yeah, there's no spin reveal, even when it comes down to Shelly. Mm -hmm. uh, she, her character where she's backstabbing George the whole time. Yeah. It's very upfront and very obvious. There's no twists, no turns. Every it's established right at the beginning what she's doing, and then from there it just goes on and on and on. Yeah. Banging her husband behind his back. Banging her husband behind his back? <laughs> That's not That'd really be hard problem. to do. <laughs> Real hard to do. Banging dudes behind her husband's back. Yeah, one dude though. She's not that big of a well, whore. We know of the one dude. That's true. I mean, yeah, there was. There isn't much to say about the depth of any of these characters. I mean, the deepest character is, I forget the name. I think his name is Harry, the main character. Johnny. 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 Yeah, yeah. yeah, Johnny. I knew it was some kind of man name. But anyway, I just think that, yeah, like, he was the deepest character uh, of them all, and even that is not saying much because, you know, his, his motivations were very flat, his uh, desires were very, you know, they didn't go far, it was just, I want to make a lot of money, rob it, rob a racetrack and get on with my life after I've just gotten out, gotten out of prison, so. And that's why I said it's kind of like this movie's pretty quaint because it's, you're watching it and you don't have to think much at all. It's a very self-contained, mm -hmm. small little story. Yes. The only thing that was big about it was I think the amount of characters and following, uh, at this time, this happened, and then now this happened, but now we have to go back to 7 a.m. and this was happening, and then it eventually became this. The non-linear format was actually a problem, and he had to recut it into a linear format, which then became more of a problem, so they just left the non-linear format. And the voiceover was later added by the studio to kind of just ease the person in, which definitely gives it more of a television kind of episodic feel to it. At 7 p.m. that same day, Johnny Clay, perhaps the most important thread in the unfinished fabric, furthered its design. I really like the nonlinear format because then you actually get to understand where each character is and what they're doing at the exact time of the heist and just like cycles through the characters and I thought that was kind of cool. But what's interesting is that, you know, you have that I think nowadays and they've perfected that technique and this was probably the first time that that kind of I, that kind of was implemented into film. Even before they had like f French Impressionism and things like that and the art house thing back in the, the 20s. But I mean, in, art house. in Hollywood blockbuster cinema, yes, you're probably correct. Yeah, and so I think, like Aiden said at the beginning, this set the bar for a lot of these heist films that we've seen this remade nowadays. We've seen all this happen with modern technology, modern... Uh, uh, century like uh, motivations and all that. It started the tropes, but movies have done it better ever since. Yeah. Well, did it start the tropes? I don't know. Because did this is 56. 
you gotta get out of that mindset that this is the first of everything. It know? just feels like you're, it's the first of everything. But you're also totally neglecting the 30s. You're totally neglecting all of the gangster movies from uh, there. You're yeah. totally neglecting all of that stuff. But this is also a Stanley Kubrick film, so you know, like nowadays, it's going to get a lot more press and say something from like a one-time director. That exactly. Only had one big film. But I, I don't think this is the first of any anything. I feel like this is a style that has been perfected. Sure. To this point, which is why you get the nonlinear format, which is why you're able to mess around with the story structure. But I, yeah, I don't think this is the first. I just, it was black and white, so I was like, oh, this must be the first movie ever made. <laughs> yeah. But getting into that, that headiness versus more straightforward Kubrick, this is very different than what you know, you're know you talking about when you're thinking of the guy who did 2001 or the guy who did Full Metal Jacket. Or The Shining. Or The Shining or things like that nature. This is a very straightforward, as far as story goes, here's a heist. And that was probably because it was early in his career. He was probably just getting his water wings, right? I mean, it's, it's relatively into it. Mm-hmm. And this is oh. 56. This is 2001 isn't that far away. And he even had his own production company because the production company was just like Kubrick and someone else. So it was probably like a joint effort, but it was still, he was still probably established at this point. Wow. We will insert the fun fact here on a popsicle stick. I don't know why I'm on a movie review show. I don't know <laughs> about movie history, <laughs> the history of cinema, film. I just know they started, you know, the silent films. and. Well, we're going to take a break real quick, and we're going to school Horacio, and we're going to give him a solid, like, how long should we beat him for? Five minutes? Nah, I'll go for a solid six. We're going to go for a solid six minutes beating Horacio. We'll be back. Please, no. wait. Communicate. Make your emergency plan today. And welcome back to The Take. Now that we've given Rossi a little bit of a lesson, don't don't ask him if he's okay. We just beat the shit out of him, so. Yeah, he got what he deserved. Don't ask him if he's okay. If he wasn't okay, he wouldn't be getting up onto the couch, would he? God damn. Oh, there you go. He's talking. Blood for weeks. He's talking. He's fine. <laughs> okay, fine. Now that Horacio is slightly recovered from his beating, let's talk a little bit more about the in-depths of this. Let's get down to music motif and how painfully bland and too type all the music is. It literally felt like every single other movie that I've seen from like the 1950s just had the exact same score. Yeah. Nothing too extreme. What I'd like to notice when he didn't use the music, though, is very key, like um, during the end, when all the music, or the... During, at the airport? At the airport, yeah. when all the money's getting blown around, nothing except the sound of the airport. During the WWE-esque <laughs> Awful bar fight. Sergei Terribly choreographed bar fight, yeah. Hey man, don't knock that suplex. That was a sweet <laughs> spin, and you know it was a sweet spin, so don't even try to like, Play on that. Okay, when he's holding off 17 guys, then it gets kind of unrealistic. Yeah. And they're making, they're not yelling whatsoever at all in the fight. Like, you see a fight nowadays, and it's, get him, and now they're just, <laughs> mops around. It's the one Russian guy with the cauliflower, man. You gotta be careful. You yeah, what the, that was racist. It's not they racist. Make, he was obviously they a boxer. Make the they Russian get, do it? That, that's ridiculous. The one guy with an accent in the entire movie, and they make him be the fall guy fight dude. No movie from, you know, prior to like 1968 or so feels like it's like real, you know? You go see a play on stage and you're, there's a, a sense of, you know, you know you're watching a play and it feels that way and nothing you see is taken real. With these movies that are what I'm talking about, these olden movies, the acting is very wooden in my opinion. The cho- fights, if there's any choreographed fights, are bad. The lines are very, again, wooden and straight to the point. And I guess it's, it's hard to be in the 21st century and watching these older movies 
with and be like amazed by them like yeah. they would have been back in 1956. Like you're saying, the wooden dialogue, everything we know about every character is given to us through dialogue. Very little as far as visual language. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and it just it's just it's hard for me when I'm watching these old movies, unless it's a movie that is uh, old and groundbreaking. Um, I can't think of one right now, but you know, unless it's groundbreaking and um, changing the landscape of cinema or it just all feels pretty much just like i don't know like we're watching a play through a tv screen well yeah it's like one of those gradual things where like each film learns from the like the previous one it gets better and better and better to like the acting you get nowadays which is like it's basically just real life yeah and uh, i guess we're spoiled in a way you know while like you said at the beginning hollywood is pumping out after after uh at least nowadays, there's a sense of realism, and you can you can really put yourself into the movie. Where I think the killing and movies of the like, you can't empathize at all. But is that because of the times? Uh, I, it's hard to really say, especially like none of us were alive during that time, so it's kind of hard to like relate to any of that. Well, he might be; he's a vampire, so you never know. I'd say it's just like the different like methods of acting have come out throughout the years and people have gotten better and better at that. So like the acting's gotten a little bit more real compared to like most people like not like during this time we're probably just from like the stage going into like screen. Yeah. I mean you get great movies throughout the years, you know, the seventies, eighties, nineties were great for awesome movies. And it's hard to go watch stuff from back in the day that is just regular fare. Man, the rest of these are gonna be difficult for you. <laughs> they probably will be and I'll probably have to look at them through a different lens and try to put myself in the film student mode rather than the I'm 30 years old and I just want stuff to entertain me mode and to you know keep me awake at 11:30 at night when I was finishing watching this um, which is a terrible idea by the way don't watch a black and white film at 11:30 at night. It's not even that long. It doesn't even cross an hour no. and a half. It's an hour and 24 minutes. I watched minutes. it at 12.30 because I couldn't get it working. I'm I am to broadcasting old. service. Okay. Let's get back to the movie. Yes. And one of the main things that I'd like to get across is no matter how perfectly you execute your plan, the unforeseen circumstances yes. that, that come to fault. Everything about the plan was unhinged by unforeseen circumstances, things you couldn't have any control over. Sure. Like... Uh, the shooter, I forget his name, but Val. Val. Val yeah. No, I'm sorry, Nikki. Nikki. Yes. Val. Val was Val's the, the boyfriend. Boyfriend of Sherry. Yeah. Yes. Apologies. Sim similar, but that was such a stupid scene. <laughs> Which one? The one where everyone gets shot because oh, the Mexican standoff. On the entire room. No, yeah. Val unloaded on the entire room. Nikki no, was the them. shooter that uh, backed up over the horse. Did you watch the movie? Movie well, did you right. her husband's name? George. George. George unloaded on the room. Oh. Yeah. yeah. George went haywire and killed everybody because George is an unreliable person in unforeseen circumstance. That he couldn't handle the little bit of pressure of thinking, oh, maybe the guy's 10 minutes late because of traffic and shoots up the entire room because of it. But most importantly, the biggest lesson of all that even still holds true today is don't trust the airport with Never trust Never the airport trust with, the your with your He would have gotten away with it if it wasn't for American Airlines. And that stupid little poodle Dumb pup. God. Nowadays, I feel like they're so misworked, they would just run over the puppy. I don't know. It's, it's funny because, like, you know, I, I guess this movie was trying to teach a lesson as well as entertain, right? Because it was trying to tell people, hey, you're never going to get away with it. So don't bother trying to rob some And that is a very pretty shot. Yeah. At the end, you got to give it to him with the right. money flying everywhere. Technically, this movie, besides the score, was really well done. I mean, it was shot well. The ADR was well done. The editing, the editing was good. Technically, this movie was a good movie. The story was fun, uh, but it was just... I think it's just a movie. It's just, okay, uh, yeah, cool. So with that super enthusiastic response, we're gonna go to commercial and when we come back, we've got some things to handle. From the moment they were born, they could do no wrong. Through the years, we've pushed them, defended them, 
tested them. They've tested us right back. They're our kids. And no matter how much they deny it, they know we've always had their back. A parent is a child's greatest influence. In these guiding moments, all we'll ever ask of them is to live a life they can be proud of. Don't let salmonella get funky with your chicken. On average, one in six Americans will get a foodborne illness this year. So learn the right temperature to cook each type of meat. Keep your family safe at foodsafety.gov. And welcome back to the take. So before we wrap this whole thing up, guys, what do you, do you think it holds up? I mean, sure, it definitely holds up. Like almost all of uh, Kubrick's kind of films, they have their own like special niche to them that makes them basically timeless. I wouldn't say it's my favorite, but I mean, it definitely holds up. All the cinematography and that kind of stuff holds up. I mean, definitely out of our time, but I liked it. Uh, I, not really. I don't know. It's just, I don't know. I'm just not, I'm not into it. I, I didn't hate it. I, I think it was well done, but... I'll never watch it again. I have no, uh, no desire to, to watch this movie again, ever. I think if you gave it to the regular person, the everyday man or woman, they would get through probably 20 minutes and hang them up. See, I think that was, I think it holds up just fine. As soon as you get over the path, fact that it's like from the 50s, it plays totally fine. Cinematography's fine. I have no overall problem with it. What are you give it a how many whatevers? Uh, I think I'm going to give it three Bloody Georges because, like I said, it was done well, but I just, I'm not into it. I think I'm going to give it three Dead Horses. I uh, like the film. wasn't anything that stood out to me too much. Yeah, it's just middle ground. Yeah. I'm going to give it four Georges' wives. Um, yeah, I like this movie. It's, it holds up well. It's a simple, compact little story. Yeah. And I think that... We need more of that in these days. But with modern storytelling style. Much like The Departed, yes. Now that, See, that is similar, a good movie, yes. Similar in vain, but you know, Correct. more modern. Yeah, better acting, color. Sing the <laughs> theme song. Male Fern, Matt, take it away! Male Fern, replay. Male Fern. Male Fern. How many do we have? Oh, we have uh, <laughs> lots of male ferns. Look at that. We have so far four. Oh, wow. oh, well, that's on the ground. So we have one for the Swedish youth. I think that's for you. Uh, we had, oh, no, that's, no, no, sorry. <laughs> I forgot. You're the Swedish Thank youth. Thank you. We have one for murderous Matt. Not that murderous. Well, who would you go after to kill and how? Um, everyone. I'm talking about killing indiscriminately, and not for money. Not for fame, not for glory. Just for fun. And Dirty Horacio. Hey, I shower every day. Habba dabba dabba da. You recently went on a cruise. What is the most R-rated thing that happened on the trip from someone who shall not be named? The whole thing was R-rated. Um, Careful. That's all I can say. The whole thing. All right. All right. <laughs> Horacio it is. What happens on the ship stays on the ship. ship. Okay. Because what happened in international waters may be seen as some as a crime here Did in the United States. Did you murder a man? I didn't murder anybody. Not that murderous. Well. So whatever happens on the ship stays on the ship. This is from Mr. Chow. <clears throat> in the film, career criminal Johnny Clay decides to do one last job before he goes straight and marries his fiancée, Faye, who is very not important to the uh, story. Do you have any plans to commit one last crime before you are no longer an unmarried man? Mr. Chow. Um, maybe I'll do a drug. Maybe. Yeah, hey, Rossi doesn't, you don't like do things. Yeah. He's uh, just at home most of the time. Yeah, there's not a lot of uh, illegal things that I uh, want to do. Hmm. Really wasted this question on him. Um, so I guess the answer is no. I'm going to just be me. Uh, I have not lived a life of crime, nor do I want to. So yeah, I think I'll just get married. All right. From Creepy Dustin, what will you do with your Blu-ray DVD collection when you die? 
Have you made any prior arrangements? Probably bury it in the woods, kind of like those hidden porno stashes that kids usually find back in the 80s. One day, one kid will be digging, find a bunch of Blu-rays. Okay, <laughs> all right. I'll play it is. All right, yes. Da 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 who has the best beard in Hollywood from Gillette Razors? Wow. Is that a sponsor? No, but my buddy Dave has got a pretty wicked beard. Is he in Hollywood yeah. right now? Yeah. Oh, he lives he? in Los Angeles, so that counts. So that's pretty wicked beard. Nice. I don't know. I feel like this is fishing. Dan's trying to fish us. He is. So let's name anybody but Dan Gordon. I, I don't know anybody in Hollywood except Probably for some Dan. some homeless people in LA that have some pretty nice that's beards. That's true. There's that like big like underpass where there's like all those tents. Tent city, yeah. Tent city, yeah. I'm sure there's some beards there. Everybody but Dan, I think, has uh, has a good beard. Dan's beard sucks. It's gross. Uh, it's not very bushy. It doesn't come in well. He kind of looks. Half of it's gone at the moment. Yeah, he kind of looks like a prepubescent boy. Um, he usually I don't think, does, though. Yeah, I don't think his balls have dropped yet. I don't think he's uh, gotten through puberty or has any testosterone in his body to speak of. Kind of um, harsh on my boy there. Oh. I mean, like, yeah, we can, like, rip on him for, like, his, his beard, but, I mean, like, you're taking it to a whole new level that I'm just not, frankly, comfortable with. You know what? If he were in the killing, he would probably jo be George. He would be the uh, clean-shaven, mousy little guy who gets cuckolded by his wife and some uh, Italian guy. Yeah. I think, that, I think that's what it'd be. George Matt. is also the one that shoots everyone in his gang, so. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, Dan would probably be the one who shot all of us. Matt would probably be the bartender, um, for obvious reasons. Uh, I think, I think Aiden, who would you be, Aiden? Who would Aiden be? Probably the police, no, you know what, you'd be the shooter that would everything up, yep. Oh. And I th obviously I'd be the big Russian guy who takes on 17 dudes because uh, I'm very strong and not from this country. And I'm going to say some random heroin addict in LA has a better beard than Dan. Is he sending us to voicemail? <laughs> Is he already replying? Sorry at work, my dude. We could do the challenge, say one mean thing about Dan. Is that the challenge? Because I feel like no, you guys no. have already said a lot of mean things about my friend, and I'm just like... <sighs> it's gonna be okay, Matt. I think, he can, okay. I think he can take it. You know what? I'm gonna make you guys do Mars Attacks. That's it, that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing next month. Mars Attacks. I'm gonna make you guys watch some fun, dumb <laughs> And, yeah. Is that prior to 1999? It's 96. 96. Oh. So it counts. Cool. It falls under my requirements. Yeah. Arr, arr. God, I hate you. All right, everybody, that's going to do it for this episode of Take. As always, I've been Matt McCormick. This is Rossi. This is going to be this. Is, uh, you can find us all on Facebook, sometimes mostly Instagram and Twitter. Follow us on Gmail. If you like what we do here, hit that subscribe button. As always, my name is Philip DeFranco. We'll see you tomorrow. Da na na na, one step at a time. This was a boring movie. Holy that put me to sleep. I can't believe you made me watch it. Oh my god, this sucks. Okay, I'm I gonna don't make know. him pay for oh, dog da, soldiers da, 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 da. Yeah, well, you made us watch UHF. UHF is great. No, no, it's not great. It's just as bad as dog soldiers, okay? Just as bad, alright? Whoa, whoa, whoa.